Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. I want to um, ask your forgiveness for having um, to go through the whole procedure of uh, showing your passports and uh, having the uh, papers with you and uh, all this. Uh, for us, it is uh, the second event that we are organizing and uh, uh, hopefully things will get better and we will be able to communicate with our audiences in a much more humane way in the future. So, um, in November 2019, the Ekaterini Laskaridis Foundation, in collaboration with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, established a Center for China Studies. The ceremony took place at uh, Maximu and was attended by the Prime Minister of Greece, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, and the President of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping. The Center of, uh, for China Studies is the fruit of the collaboration between the Ekaterini Laskaridis Foundation and the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, the leading academic uh, research of China. The CAS ALF Center for China Studies uh, for short, we use the term CAX, is housed at the Foundation's premises here. Both Greece and China are countries with a great civilization and rich history, so this cooperation, built with the objective of promoting exchange and cooperation in arts, humanities and social sciences, is founded on solid ground. In the context of the operation of the Center of Chinese Studies, the Ekaterini Laskaridis Foundation requested the support and advice of Dr. Konstantinos Tsimonis, uh, until recently lecturer in Chinese sociology at King's College. Under Professor Tsimonis' guidance, we organize a series of lectures in order to introduce the general public in Greece to the recent history of China. Today's presentation is the first of a series of monthly events focusing in modern China. The theme of the event today is China and Western modernity, the century of humiliation, and China's struggle to regain world power status. We are honored to host as main speaker tonight Dr. Igor Rogella, lecturer in world policy at the University of London. The event is being broadcast online with live streaming on the Foundation's website, Facebook, but also through the Zoom platform. I would like to stress that through the Zoom platform, viewers are able to send comments and questions that will be addressed during the discussion period that will follow. For this, I would like to thank Hariklia Panagu, a bright young student at Pandion University who is working with us for two months. With these uh, general introductory words, and in the anticipation of a very interesting discussion that uh, will follow, I pass the floor to Professor Tsimonis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mazarakis. I would like to thank the Foundation for hosting uh, this uh, lecture series. Uh, we hope to bring uh, prominent scholars uh, from around the world uh, here uh, in Athens in Piraeus to share their knowledge and insights on China. Let me say a couple of words uh, about our speaker today, who is also uh, a good friend. Uh, Dr. Igor Agelia is a lecturer in global politics, uh, working mostly uh, on international infrastructure and Chinese politics. Uh, he was previously based at the Lao China Institute. Now he's uh, in uh, University College London. Uh, he has published in the top journals of the field, uh, such as China Quarterly and Political Geography. And his talk today uh, is, is uh, called, is titled, The Century of Humiliation and China's uh, Struggle to Regain World Power Status. Uh, and this is a very interesting talk uh, and um, very topical uh, because China's past remains relevant today in many ways in the sense of victimhood uh, that is alive uh, through education and popular culture. And of course, in Chinese nationalism, which is becoming increasingly uh, xenophobic, uh, limiting 
even the foreign policy choices uh, of the Chinese leadership. Now we'll discuss these dimensions, of course, in the Q&A. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rogelia. Igor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hello, good evening. Thank you. Um, first, of course, to the Foundation for inviting me. Um, it, it's a great honor to be, of course, the inaugural speaker um, for your new and exciting um, series of lectures. Um, it, it also feels even better to be able to deliver this in person. I know it's a hybrid event. It's also uh, a first for me, although I think there'll be quite many this year. Um, so it's great to stand here in this beautiful library and be able to talk about things that um, excite me and then hopefully we'll um, you know, come to a, a place where we can have a lively discussion afterwards. Um, thank you also, um, Costa Simonis, um, of course, for, for the introduction. I hope to be able to return the favor soon and, and organize something at UCL and invite you over. Um, so this evening I want to talk about two things, really. Um, and the first is essentially a story of how Western modernity, and I'll talk a bit more about what I mean by this, how it arrived in China and what consequences that had. And this story has quite a few different characters, if you think of it as a kind of play. Um, there's also lots of uh, different objects of importance to this story. Um, so I'll talk about paper money, I'll talk about silver, I'll talk about copper, um, I will talk a little bit about opium, tea, porcelain, all these things, all these objects. Um, assets, you know, sort of tradable goods, they were very important at the time. But alongside these props, you have a, a cast of very um, diverse characters, uh, ranging from, you know, drunk English sailors um, to Armenian silver lenders um, and, you know, arrogant Qing officials and, and ang angry Chinese peasants um, revolting um, against the many injustices that they faced. So it's a very complex story. Um, that stretches along this very long century of, of humiliation. Um, the, this, you know, this is a, a more recent term, actually, of course, has been to, to designate this century of humiliation. And this is roughly speaking from the mid 19th century to, to 1949, when China is um, then, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, liberated by, by the Communist Party. Um, and this brings me to the second part of the talk for tonight, which will be um, a kind of afterthought. So I'll talk a little bit as a kind of epilogue, um, almost, where I want to look at this idea of how this humiliation, how this idea of how this um, persistent belief in victimhood affects um, China's relations with the world, but also, you know, sort of um, its own kind of self-image. So we'll outline, let's say, um, where the notion of national humiliation comes from, um, particularly by exploring the trauma that happened as a result of China's crash with, with Western uh, modernity. I forgot the clip. Um, so, <clears throat> before we go there, um, I have a kind of a, a story to kind of um, talk about here. Um, so let me begin in the year 2000 in, in Hong Kong. Um, so, at that time, three artifacts were put up for auction um, at the world's two most prestigious um, auction houses, so Christie's and Sotheby's. Um, these were animal figures. Um, actually, they were the heads of a tiger, a monkey, and an ox, to be precise. Um, collectively, these form part of 12 statues of bronze heads known as the, um, the zodiac animals or the zodiac statues. Um, they're, they're part of you know, a set of 12 because they represent 12 of the animals of the Chinese zodiac. They used to be part of a fountain um, in the old summer palace um, in Beijing. Um, but what's crucial for the story here is that these figurines were looted by British and French soldiers in 1860 um, when the old summer palace was burned down. Um, interestingly, it was burned down at the orders of Lord Elgin, um, the son of the Lord Elgin who stole the marbles from the Parthenon, so quite, quite a family there. Um, and during these, this looting, the bronzes were, were hacked off the fountain, packed up, and for the, long t for the longest time they kind of disappeared um, into private ownership, only to then resurface um, in the year 2000 and an auction in Hong Kong. And this sparked off a huge amount of anger. Um, both, both government and kind of popular anger. 
Um, in the end, um, a Chinese state-owned enterprise, um, Polygroup, actually bought the, the, the figures for a sum that was uh, wildly above the expected price. So for the three heads, they paid $4 million. This was way above the, the kind of expected price. So I think Christie's and Sotheby's were very happy. Um, and then in 2009, two more heads appeared. This time it was an auction in Paris. Um, this was a, a rabbit and a rat. Um, and these two actually used to be owned by, by Yves Saint Laurent, um, and then were now being sold by his business partner, uh, Pierre Berger. Um, a Chinese businessman again won the auction, again by overbidding quite wildly, um, but then he refused to pay the money. He said, actually, no, this, is, this you know, whole auction is completely unfair, these objects are stolen, um, China and Chinese nationals should not be paying to retrieve them back. Um, there was a big scandal because Pierre Berger said, I will sell them to you as soon as you say that um, you are oppressing rights of Tibetans, etc., etc. So he was, you know, kind of enjoying the publicity, I think. Um, so in the end, nothing happened. But later on, um, a different owner who acquired the, sta the statues then actually donated them to China as a gesture of goodwill. So they actually returned to China. Um, five are still missing. But they are kind of a, a recurring motif. They appear on a stamp collection. There's reproductions of them all over China. Um, and you know, this kind of um, gets you to wonder, like, why, what, what is it so important about these statues? Um, I mean, yes, they're kind of cute animal heads, which you know, I mean, we all like, of course. Um, but why, why have they become so important? Why have they become imbued with so much meaning and so much uh, you know, kind of national fervor? Um, and of course, it's because they've become associated very closely with this idea of national humiliation. And of course, by um, retrieving these objects, by returning them to China, you can also then say that, in essence, you are dealing with this legacy of, of humiliation, in essence, in essence, writing these old, um, old wrongs. But so how did this um, humiliation start from? Where, where, does it, where does it come from? Why, why is it such? Why has it left such an important mark um, on Chinese society? Um, so this is essentially what I want to talk about um, today. How this incorporation into modernity happened, why it was so traumatic, um, and why it still causes so much um, both official and popular anger, because it's, it's, not, just, it's not just the kind of the, the party narrative. OK, so um, historical context. So, so uh, you're celebrating 200 years from the start of the, the War of Independence in Greece. So let's start from there, 1821. What is, what is China doing? Um, China is still a um, huge agrarian empire ruled by the Qing dynasty. Um, the Qing dynasty originally was founded by, by Manchu um, invaders, let's call them. Um, but they actually very quickly became Chinese, um, adopted not just the custom, but actually became um, guardians of, of Chinese cultural and civilizational achievements. So I'm a political scientist, so of course I'm, I'm really fascinated by um, you know, the state and what the state looks like. And this is uh, you know, an amazing state. It, it has survived millennia. It has uh, one of the most complex bureaucracies um, that manages this huge you know, land, a huge amount of people, and so on. It's an, it's an old and venerable state. It's also a society which, even though it was extremely unequal, retained a kind of commitment to meritocracy with things like you know, exams for, for positions and so on. And yes, they were um, over time eroded by corrupt practices and you know, the rich got ahead and that's fine. But the commitment was there in a way that never existed in Europe until maybe the French Revolution at the earliest. Right? So it was also a, a society which was quite progressive in certain ways. But for the purposes of our story, this was at a time also a state that was, that was losing the grip on the country. Why? Well, because China's population grew massively during the Qing, um, the Qing period. You can say this is a reflection of, of good governance, of the relative peace and prosperity that was there. Uh, partly, though, it's also because um, new crops were introduced from the new world. Um, things like corn, potatoes. I mean, also tomatoes and, and chilies, but they're not that nutritious. I think it's the corn and the potatoes um, that you know, precipitated this growth in, in population. So uh, while, yes, OK, the Chinese probably didn't discover America. I mean, there are historians that would disagree with this. But China was definitely part of the early modern world. Right? So we see this 
in, in the fact that it was affected by, let's say, new crops. It was affected by this um, you know, emerging set of net of trading networks that were happening during the time. Um, the modern world and its increasingly connected geography, right? But at this time, in 1821, China was still certain of its superiority, of its, uh, of its centrality of its civilization, uh, particularly in, in its immediate region. So Qing China dealt with the world on its own terms. This is something that I would like you to, to remember. Um, so neighboring lands like Korea, Vietnam, and so on in particular would actually you know, compete to send missions of tribute to Beijing that would then enable them to, to have formal relations with China, to trade with China. And even the more recently arrived European traders, um, they were safely confined to, to the southern fringes of the empire. They weren't really uh, a big bother as far as, as far as the court in Beijing is concerned. But only a few decades later, two decades later to be precise, China's status collapsed dramatically, right? Um, from being able to say no, from being able to actually you know, deal with the world on its own terms, um, it became a, a humiliated and backward empire. Um, and then you know, sort of this century of humiliation actually started. So how did this happen and why is it relevant today? So before I answer this, I think I need to stop and say a few words about what I mean by Western modernity, because it's a, it's in, it was in the title of my talk, so I really need to go there. Um, so in many ways, the way I use this term, Western modernity, you, there are lots of similarities with early capitalism and how it emerged. Uh, but it's more than that. It's about the expansion of a singular and integrated economic system that was actually based on, on three European innovations. The first innovation that you have, uh, this idea of sovereign states. And these sovereign states are equal to each other. Um, each has their own territory, their own laws, their own customs, um, and there's no higher authority above them. Um, of course, there are differences in power, but essentially there's nothing sort of above them and they can deal with each other um, in a kind of rational sense. They're, they're kind of an, uh, the ultimate expression of some kind of civic rationality um, and you know, very much connected to, to the kind of philosophical traditions that were happening in Europe at the time. Secondly, and, and this is very important, the Europeans demonstrated a willingness to use violence, i.e. the military, to support and further um, the economic interests of its own citizens globally, and increasingly also had the capacity to do so um, in various parts of the world, be it the Americas, be it um, Africa, be it the Indian subcontinent, and for um, our story also in China. Which leads to this third innovation, so-called, and that, that's colonialism, right? That's another um, innovation and, and a kind of, in a way, something that gave Europe the edge to, to spread its own economic system um, all, all over. Um, so this modernity started in Europe, in, in say, the, in the Netherlands, of today's Netherlands, um, and England, to be precise, um, where the state actually was very heavily influenced by a class of, of traders that had global ambitions, um, and you know, that, that had um, this kind of commitment to, to expanding trade um, wherever they went. So the Dutch East Indies Company, or the, the, the VOC, um, is, is one kind of prime example of this early state within a state, and these were the actors that, that actually were really spreading and pushing um, a certain way of dealing with things further and further away. Um, so this was an early modern corporation, you could say. It had its own army, but it was also relying on the Dutch Navy to, to help it when it was in trouble, um, to, to kind of maintain and expand its trade networks, monopolistic trade networks. Um, it also has a very dark history. It engaged in, in massacres of local population in, in what is today Indonesia, um, in the establishment of plantations, uh, setting off also mass migration of workers from one part of the, of, of the world to another. And, and most of Western Europe actually quite quickly adopted this type of model, mainly through imitation. So other countries like France uh, and so on also um, went on to, to you know, set up their own trading companies, their own colonies, their own spheres of interest. What was far less clear was how non-European states, and they existed, um, could become equal participants in this system. Well, the closest example probably is, is Russia. Um, um, you know, much like China, a, an agrarian empire uh, where most of the population lived almost uh, like slaves, but which managed to reform itself to, to become something that looks very much like a modern European state um, under Peter the Great and his successors. 
The reforms, of course, were, were incomplete and painful. Um, but nevertheless, Russia was then accepted as part of this world system that was spreading out. Um, and even further afield, then, how did this look like? Well, if you look at the Americas, Australia, Africa, there the Europeans came and saw nothing that looked like a modern state. So they just colonized it through their own settlers and incorporated it like that. Um, in Asia, however, it's different, because there you had very old, complex societies which had states, militaries, bureaucracies, and so on. So very much, uh, you know, uh, from the point of view of a European coming there, they recognized some level of statehood, or might I even say, you know, civilization. And this enabled these states to actually, if they so desired, reform themselves and also become something more like a modern European sovereign state. So Japan obviously did it very well, um, but also Siam, Persia, and so on, um, remained independent and you know, tried to reform themselves into these kind of modern um, participants of this world system. Others, however, were unsuccessful. Um, the Mughal Empire um, in today's India, of course, fell to the British. Vietnam, um, again, you know, a very complex, uh, venerable state, was ended up being colonized by the French. So China's story here is actually particularly interesting because as I mentioned earlier, only a relatively short time before its kind of traumatic encounter and fall from grace, um, China was, was actually the engine of the world economy. In many ways, it was the engine of the world economy without even realizing this itself. Um, and I'm emphasizing this because we often hear that Qing Empire China was a kind of closed empire ruled by arrogant officials who didn't know anything about the outside world. And I'm kind of trying to challenge that a little bit. It's not, um, it's not the entire picture. Um, but let me illustrate first what I mean by, by China being the motor of the, of the world economy. Um, just, by the way, all the slides are just pictures for atmospheric purposes and so on. Uh, but this next one, this is a, a, you know, sort of um, paper money. We all know, of course, that uh, um, China invented um, paper money, right? Um, it was introduced far early in the period we're talking about in, in the Song Dynasty. Um, but it was used quite extensively in, in the Ming Dynasty, which is a dynasty that preceded the, the Qing. And this coincides roughly with the European Renaissance. So we're talking about, you know, 1540s and so on. Paper money, of course, is only good as long as there's trust in it. As soon as there is no trust in paper money, then it's just paper, not money. Um, and this is kind of what happened in, in the Ming times. Um, you know, with runaway inflation, people stopped trusting uh, paper money. So what happens, then people switch to a more trustworthy currency. And that, in China's case, was silver. Um, just as a short aside, why is silver good? Because um, it's less expensive than gold. Gold is actually difficult to use for smaller transactions because it's too valuable. Um, but unlike copper, it's very easy to check purity of silver. So it's a kind of perfect in-between Goldilocks zone here. Um, so once this huge empire switches from using paper money to silver, of course, it has a huge demand for silver. Suddenly. Everybody wants to have silver because you need silver for everything. Taxes are collected in silver and so on. So this huge demand um, is, is such that actually silver in China, when you measure it to how much gold you get for it, is worth twice as much than it is in Europe. So from a perspective of a European, going to China with a lot of silver, which you now have because of all the mines and, and you know, the, the new world and the Americas, is great. It makes perfect economic sense. Um, historically, Chinese demand for silver was met by Japan. And actually, um, there is one particular Japanese family. Um, you may have heard of them, the, the Tokugawa clan, um, who control all the silver mines during the time. And they profit very handsomely off this and use this to essentially win the civil war in Japan and, and set up the Tokugawa shogun. So again, even in the history of Japan, we see how this change from paper money to silver um, you know, kind of has this direct effect on this neighboring country. But the Spanish become the biggest suppliers of silver um, during the time. Um, and this silver-based trade was so, so lucrative that it created um, the first truly global network of trade. So this is the first time that you had um, a network that was actually connected by purpose, not by accident. You had, of course, networks before where you know, we all know of the Silk Road and so on, but there um, very few people traveled from one end to the other of the Silk Road. The Silk Road is essentially a lot of small transactions that happen in a certain corridor. This is the first time when you had people knowing that they are part of this bigger um, network. So the, the arrows uh, represent the flow of silver, and as you see, um, it kind of just ends up in China. Um, 
The Europeans were, of course, not the only traders who were aware of this, you know, business opportunity, let's say, but they were the only ones to use military power to force through a system that was, that was um, essentially favoring them. So while China's demand for silver may have been the engine of this early, the first sort of global trading system, um, it was actually Western modernity, this kind of idea of like how, um, how international relations and how international economy should look like, that's what spread. So that's, you know, the engine was running, but what it was producing was, was this. Later on, of course, the Europeans, you know, develop a, a taste for Chinese products like silk, porcelain, um, and especially tea. So while, you know, silver is, is the early um, instigator of this later on, um, the problem is a bit different. The problem is that the Europeans want, let's say, tea and porcelain and so on, um, but they have nothing to offer in return apart from silver. And this exchange, which used to be great for the Europeans, during the time this exchange erode, you know, as economists would have us believe that would always happen, a kind of equilibrium is, is established. So they still traded in China, all these Europeans were still going there, going to Canton 3, but they were increasingly unhappy. Why were they unhappy? Because actually China set up a very restrictive system um, of trades known as the, the Canton system, called after the city of Canton, or basically Guangzhou. Um, and Europeans were, were only allowed to trade through intermediaries. They weren't allowed to, let's say, go and roam around China to look for the best tea supplier. They had to trust somebody in the port to go and do that for them. They were only allowed to trade in certain periods, so every winter they had to leave and go back to Macau, um, which we know was, was already um, under Portuguese control. Payments had to be made in silver, and as I said, that was um, increasingly expensive. And remember that Europeans elsewhere are used to, you know, morphing and changing trade relations in a way that favors them, but here China was simply too strong um, to force into submission, so they just kind of learned um, to, to live with it. And in any case, you know, huge fortunes were still to be made. So. Um, but there was one trading nation that had slightly different plans, and that's the British. So we all know the British are obsessed with tea, still national obsession. Um, and although they start growing it in, in Assam, in, in India, um, that particular enterprise um, doesn't go very well in the beginning. Um, they try growing tea in the middle of nowhere. Nobody wants to work there. Um, it's quite difficult to, to start this huge production out of nowhere. So they're still reliant on China for most of the tea that they drink. Um, as I mentioned before, paying for tea with silver is expensive. So instead, they come up with an ingenious solution, which is, of course, opium. So the British East India Company, which much like the Dutch East Indies Company, was a kind of corporation that had a, a royal charter for, to, to conduct monopolistic trade, um, but increasingly was, was behaving like a state within a state with its own army, its own bureaucracy, its own territories, and so on. So the, the British East India Company um, started producing opium in, in Bengal, um, using cheap labor there, and then transported it to India, uh, sorry, to China, where it was then sold to Chinese intermediaries. Um, many of the traders that actually operated in, in Canton as these indep independent traders who were moving the opium from the East India Company to the Chinese traders were actually Scottish, weirdly. Um, this is because Scots were still kind of at the time locked out of the English-dominated elite, so many of them left Britain to seek wealth abroad. So there's, a, there's actually a very good book published recently, which is Mr. Smith Goes to Canton, um, which is about three Scottish people, all of whom are called Mr. Smith, um, and you know, all of which have these fantastic stories about you know, how they interacted with the Chinese traders there. Um, so these traders, they're committed to free trade. This is a, quite a novel concept at the time. Remember, most of these, you know, the big corporations, they're not about free trade the East India Company, the Dutch East Indies Company, they're, mono they're monopolists, right? But these small traders, they believe in free trade. They believe in you know, opening up the, the doors to commerce and so on. And increasingly, the British government actually also agrees with them. And they grow to great lengths to try and open China up. Um, one Scottish trader even actually bribes a British Navy admiral um, to get two warships um, to go to Canton because he wants to actually force a Chinese merchant to pay a debt to him that he owes him. Um, you know, it doesn't really end too well. Um, these free traders were constantly flirting with war, actually. Um, and you know, again, you see this kind of pattern of how trade and war, trade and violence, actually, were quite close during this time. <clears throat> 
Uh, the British government didn't always agree with them, um, but it did send several missions to China to try and persuade China, come on, let's open up, let's agree to something better than this um, you know, system of trade. Uh, but the Chinese were not interested. Um, yet despite these limitations, the British were excellent at selling opium. Um, this is just a, it's a kind of a, just a vignette showing two Chinese opium smokers as kind of a, you know, atmospheric material, as I said earlier. Um, so the British were so good at selling opium, in fact, that the flow of silver, which was always going towards China, reversed. Suddenly, China started bleeding silver out. Um, why? Because you know, it, it had to pay for this, for this addiction. Um, and really, I mean, if you think about it, uh, it's, it's a great business model, right? You sell somebody something addictive, um, and they need it more and more and more and more, and great, it's, you know, business is, is booming. Um, and it wasn't just the British making money off this, of course. Chinese merchants in, in Canton were very happy to trade in opium, um, especially because many of them were hugely indebted to Armenian silver lenders, um, so they had to pay debt. And um, the, the average loan was, was uh, the interest was about 36% per year. Um, I mean, that was also the maximum allowed, but of course, everybody charged the maximum. Um, so this was quite unsustainable. So of course, many of them had to sell more and more opium to be able to pay um, for these debts. Obviously, uh, an opium epidemic is, is bad for all sorts of reasons, you know, health, society, and so on. But the effects here were felt beyond just, let's say, the, the users of the drug. Um, so for example, remember I said that silver was the currency of the state in China, right? Um, that's also true for the rich, but not so much for the poor. If you're poor, you don't really use silver, you would use copper coins, because your transactions are quite small. But because there's suddenly a lack of silver in China, um, silver becomes more expensive when you express it in copper coins. And because the taxes are in silver, it means that you, if you're a peasant, you need to sell much more of your stuff. You need to produce much more to be able to pay those taxes, which now are worth much more of your copper money, let's say. And this is just one of the reasons, of course, why um, you also have a huge series of, of, of peasant rebellions, particularly in southern China, which was most affected by these, these shifts, by this you know, slow car crash of China into these global trading networks in a way that was not actually advantageous to China, but was oftentimes um, you know, put it in a kind of inferior position. Um, and remember, again, you know, the, the, how European modernity was spread not just by trade, but also by, by, by weapons, by war. Um, this is, of course, exactly what happens here as well. Um, China bans opium mainly. Um, I mean, opium was actually technically banned. Already. What they ban is the, the trade of foreigners selling opium. Um, so that particular thing, they sort of ban even more. Um, but really, they're worried about the outflow of silver. That's what really worries them. So they send this virtuous official, um, Lin Zexu, he's quite famous and he's quite venerated as a, as a you know, kind of a real stand-up guy. I think he's probably um, a bit overrated, but that's another story. Um, what does he do? He bans opium, he seizes all the opium stocks in Canton, um, and this infuriates the British. Uh, they protest, um, but nothing much happens really here. Um, the, the, the Chinese even, actually very interesting, send, send a letter to Queen Victoria saying, sort of imploring her to, to intervene, uh, because they say, well, you know it's bad. You, know, you, you have banned opium in, in Britain. Why are your people selling it here? Um, I, I do not know if, if they receive a reply, but certainly I, I'm not aware of it. So the Chinese kind of rightfully suspect the British of a bit of hypocrisy here. Um, but by then, it's of course too late. You have powerful interest groups um, in, in London that are lobbying for war, and, and war is, is what they get. Um, a couple of English sailors get drunk, uh, they beat up a local villager to death, um, and then their, their commanding officer um, actually extracts them because he fears that if they get arrested by Chinese authorities, they will be executed. Um, so they're, they're taken to a British ship. Um, there's a kind of trial there, um, but this infures the Chinese. They, they actually stop selling the water and food to the British traders there, um, and basically war starts. So. Boom. Um, I'm not much of a war historian, but to summarize it, it goes very badly for China. Um, so Britain becomes the first Western nation that actually by force extracts new types of treaties, new types of trading concessions from China. And these are the so-called unequal treaties. Um, before you know it, other European nations essentially smell you know, the blood in the water. Um, and you know, everyone from France to the United States to tiny Belgium um, has, you know, has the opportunity to, to um, extract an unequal treaty. So what are these treaties, actually? 
Um, well, they, they give certain uh, protection to the lives of property, to the lives and property of Westerners in China. They allow them to trade everywhere they want. Uh, they allow Western missionaries to spread Christianity wherever they want. Uh, they get territorial concessions, so these uh, are called treaty ports, where essentially the Chinese state has no jurisdiction. So, you know, what does this kind of forceful and sudden entry into, into modernity look like? Um, well, initially, it's, it's chaos. So what happens in these treaty ports? It's chaos. Um, and one, one British diplomat at the time writes, um, and I quote, China as a whole was invaded by a swarm of adventurers from many nations during this period. Smuggling, trading in opium, the coolie traffic, evasion of duties, dealing in weapons, and other contraband were engaged in all sides, end quote. So it wasn't just adventurous foreigners coming to China. The quote mentions coolie traffic. Uh, coolies were, were Chinese workers which were essentially sold into a kind of half slavery, indentured servitude overseas. Um, so this period also marked the start of, of mass Chinese migration outwards as well. So you really see how you know, these, these kind of ruptures are quite sudden. And when they happen, they, they affect huge amounts of people. Right? Um, so here you have the China becomes very much part of the world economy, but not on its own terms. Um, from being uh, a center of this old pre-modern world, it is now firmly on the periphery of the world. Um, it is being drained of resources. Um, it's a supplier of cheap labor. Uh, it's no longer even able to collect customs on its own. So the Westerners actually set up a body to collect customs on behalf of China, of course, at an you know, advantageously low rate. So all the advantages that China had historically soon began to be eroded. Uh, the Chinese state was becoming weaker and weaker. It was undermined by, by you know, foreign imperialism, but also by domestic rebellions. Remember, you know, the, the angry peasants. Um, and even the traditional industries in China, like silk, porcelain, they start losing their edge when they're faced with this global market. Japan starts making better and cheaper silk. Uh, the Dutch, the English, and the Germans start, uh, you know, make, making cheaper porcelain and so on. Um, and the British starts really succeeding at growing tea in India. In, in a more efficient way. And then this, so this really affects Chinese society, which for centuries was, was virtually unchanging, um, was kind of, you know, in this kind of stable equilibrium, um, one might call it, organized along Confucian doctrines. So this society began to fracture. Um, there were new pressures, new social groups emerging. Um, some benefited from the arrival of modernity, some lost. Um, new classes emerged, new divisions were created. And even in the wider East Asian region, you really see how China's system of diplomacy begins to fall apart. Uh, remember earlier, I mentioned sort of Korea and Vietnam being, you know, very dutiful sort of, you know, example students. Um, well, they're removed from China's sphere forcibly, Vietnam by France, Korea by Japan. Um, so you really see even, you know, on the international stage, China's world is, is crumbling. It's kind of washing away. Now, it would be unfair to say that the Qing Empire did absolutely nothing. Um, the, the authorities in Beijing do realize that something needs to be done, something needs to change. So they embark on a series of reforms, and this is called the self-strengthening movement. Um, so here you have them, some of the um, reformers. So the idea that underpinned this policy right, was to keep Chinese essence, things like how society looks like, um, how the government is organized, and then only selectively adopt certain things from Western technology learning. Mainly they were interested in, in military applications because they, they felt the need to defend China, um, you know, having just lost um, a war. Um, so this, this etching, for example, is, is of the, uh, the Dongli Yaman, which is a kind of a, 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 the first foreign ministry of China, um, one which was established specifically to deal with foreigners on a more equal footing, because before, the foreigners didn't fit anywhere. They were being handled by, by the, the Ministry of Rights, because foreign affairs is essentially about ritual that, you know, sort of um, within this kind of Confucian state. Um, However, unlike similar reformed institutions that happen in, in, in Russia, in Japan, also in the Ottoman Empire, um, the Chinese saw no, saw no need to, to, to kind of change the fundamentals. Um, but not just that, even some of the outward appearance. So, for example, you know, the, the Japanese um, government of this time, they start appearing in, in Western uniforms. Here you see it's not the case, right? So very much um, the, the, even the outward projection remains um, quite the same. So this approach you know, proved to be quite difficult. Um, it's difficult to, to modernize selectively. It's expensive, it's wasteful, it's prone to huge corruption. It actually fails um, its very first test 
which is a, a war with Japan, again, boom. Um, so this is 1895. This defeat was especially painful. Uh, why? Because from China's point of view, Japan was always clearly an inferior state. Um, and now suddenly, you know, it has lost Japan. It wasn't just China that was surprised. Most of the Westerners observing China at the time thought that Japan had absolutely no chance of defeating China in this, in this war. Um, and they were all quite surprised as a result. So from then on, China really is seen as, as um, the sick man of Asia. This is kind of a, an expression from that time. And also why, um, you know, if you think of, let's say, the, the COVID pandemic, why so many people in China were outraged um, when, you know, you had this talk of the sick man of Asia. Because it, again, it really connected and really resonated with this the idea of humiliation that happened, you know, 100 years before. Um, but it wasn't just foreigners which actually thought ill of China. Many domestic um, you know, young Chinese nationalists and writers of the time um, saw in China the same kind of symptoms. They, they declared their country to be backward, deficient, to be insane. I mean, this is a really a period of, 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 of time when people are kind of questioning, um, you know, the existing morality, the existing um, fabric of society. So essentially, you see that this meeting with modernity is, is traumatic, of course. Um, you know, first of all, because China loses sovereignty, ports, all these kind of, you know, big politics things. But it's also traumatic on a, on a kind of personal level, um, especially for, for intellectuals, for students, and so on. And by the early 20th century, there were actually a lot of people with a lot of very strong opinions about what direction China should take. So not just about, you know, how to deal with the immediate crisis, but actually thinking more, um, more kind of long term. The most famous among them at the time is, is um, a person who in the West is, called, is, is known as, as Sun Yat-sen, um, who at the time was, was in exile in Japan, um, leading a movement to overthrow the, the Qing Empire from remotely and change China into a republic. Um, and actually, the very first opportunity to do so comes pretty quickly. Um, in 1911, 110 years ago, lots of anniversaries here, um, you have a revolution that ends the, the Qing Empire, and you have the birth of the Republic of China, which is a, you know, a state that still um, very much exists, even though it's um, only limited to Taiwan. Um, this revolution removed the empire, yes, um, but actually brought very little in its, own, in, its, in its place. It brought chaos, civil war, um, and constant and increasing aggression by Japan. But in this chaos of, of New China, we see that modernity didn't just bring guns and opium and unequal treaties, it also brought quite radical new ideas. Um, everything from nationalism, um, you know, which really Im importantly contributed to the fall of, of the Qing Empire, um, to, to things like socialism and so on. Soon, um, you know, Chinese intellectuals and students turned their attention to, to, to China's international standing as well. Why was it so weak? Why is China so poor? Why is China treated so badly by all these imperialists everywhere? And after World War II, you have a particular kind of um, conflagration, huge ang anger in China that the colonies that were formerly controlled by Germany were just given to Japan by the Westerners who were increasingly not that interested in, in the affairs of China um, and were you know, rushing towards their own uh, apocalypse uh, you know, just a few decades later. So here we see a kind of um, a group of students. I mean, this is not uh, this is a later representation um, protesting um, on on May fourth. So this this gives birth to the May fourth movement, uh, which is kind of the intellectual origins also the, of the Communist Party of China. So it's very much um, important and and still you know venerated. Um, but before uh, you know China could come to its own decision about whether it's going to be a bourgeois republic or a socialist state or a pseudo fascist country or a communist country. Um, this is all, you know, this debate is, is rudely interrupted by Japan invading in 1937, starting a war that, of course, from a Western perspective, overlaps with World War II, but it, it's very important to understand it as a separate event, as an event also which is characterized by, by extreme brutality and extreme kind of um, inhumane behavior um, by, the, by the Japanese aggressors. Um, you know, events like the Nanjing Massacre and, you know, sort of um, tests of biological weapons on, on um, civilians um, are, you know, clearly events that resonate still. Um, so this in many ways presents the culmination of this national humiliation, um, the, war, the war with Japan, that is. 
um, which then the, the government which took over in 1949 um, under the communists vowed that it will never happen again. So this is a very important um, kind of cornerstone of, um, let's say, not, not policy, but a more kind of more grand identity of what, you know, what the, the CCP stands for in, in relation to China. So what's interesting here, however, is that once the communists came into power, they kind of stopped talking about national humiliation. They stopped talking about Japan. They actually pursue, try to pursue friendly relations with Japan because they know that they need Japan. And it's actually the Americans that tell Japan, no, 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 you will not deal with them. Um, so they, they try very hard um, to forget and ignore this victimization. Um, they wanted to focus squarely on the future. So while they uh, accepted that wrongs had happened, um, they were mainly blamed on, on foreigners, on domestic reactionaries, and, and kind of there was a line to be drawn under this. And, and Mao Zedong himself, for example, writes, and I quote, the Chinese have always been a great, courageous, and industrious nation. It is only in modern times that they have fallen behind. And that was due entirely to oppression and exploitation by foreign imperialism and domestic reactionary governments, end quote. So the emphasis here is, is on injustice, but this injustice has now been corrected. The domestic reactionaries have been overthrown. The Western the imperialists have been chased out, and now you know, that has been corrected. Um, so what we saw in the Maoist period is actually a turning away from talking about the past, a really strong focus on the future with very strong also utopian undertones, uh, which of course are partly to be blamed for, for not one, but two huge disasters um, in Maoism, of course the Great Leap Forward and then the chaos of the Cultural Revolution. Um, and there's very little space in this kind of chaotic time for any kind of balanced discussion of, of history, let alone some kind of transnational effort um, at real reconciliation, the type of which we saw, for example, in Europe after World War II. But so what changed? So why is it that today's CCP, so I, the, the Communist Party, talks so often about national humiliation? Um, why can't they just be proud of China's achievements, for example? What's the purpose of, of bringing back this, this victim narrative, right? Um, if, you know, didn't we already get rid of it? Um, well, of course, many things changed after the fall, after the end, didn't really fall, the end of Maoism, sorry. Um, politics in China moved from, from class struggle to, to something else. And I think this kind of ethnocentric nationalism increasingly became an important part um, of the narrative. And particularly um, following the, the failed um, student uprising um, in, in 1989, the CCP became very worried about what to replace this communist ideology with. Suddenly people weren't buying it. Nobody was you know, cared about class struggle anymore. So what to replace it with? Well, one of the things, not the only, but one of the things was also this kind of the pride, but also the indignation, the, the nationalism, but also the, the victimhood. So you have a kind of, there's a, there's a really kind of um, interesting duality here of, of being both victim and victor, both, um, you know, both being proud and ashamed of, of, of history. Um, yeah, so this is just one kind of uh, very happy utopian um, part here. Um, so one of the things that actually happened is that you suddenly have a revival of, of uh, all this information, um, textbooks suddenly emerge uh, detailing suffering um, at the hands of foreign aggression, particularly Japan, but, but also, let's say, the earlier, um, the earlier um, imperialists and so on. You see this in history textbooks, um, and you know, really this, this victimhood and martyrhood become um, quite important. So, you know, as a kind of epilogue, how does this affect then modern Chinese diplomacy? Well, it makes it very difficult. Right? I mean, China often behaves um, like, a, like a very fragile superpower, one that, that can get offended very easily, that, whose ego can get bruised very easily. Um, domestically, casual nationalism is increasingly not only common, it, it's almost expected. Um, often you, you see, you know, various Chinese celebrities are often hounded for, for you know, infractions against national pride. Uh, for example, recently, I forgot who it was, uh, I'm not a, a big kind of celebrity follower, but uh, somebody went to the Yasukuni Shrine in, in Tokyo to take a selfie. Um, this was, of course, the end of this person's career. That's it, forget about it. Um, so particularly when it comes to relations with Japan, um, this victim narrative that was constructed over the last four decades is not going to go away. Um, but it's interesting because this is a victim nar narrative that did not exist following the war. 
there, there were decades where this was not a thing that was talked about. Um, because why? Because it, 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 it interfered with a, a more optimistic vision of, of China being reborn after 1949, right? Now, talking about all these poor civilians being, being slaughtered, it doesn't, it doesn't fit with the kind of heroic image. So this was suppressed. But of course, when you suppress you know, painful memories especially, they tend to come back um, you know, even more ferocious. And now there's a kind of an inflation of various memory sites and, and museum sites dedicated to national humiliation. It's very much um, an important part here. Um, now, this was an oversight. This should be from before, but the, 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 this, I'll just finish with this one. Um, so with, with Xi Jinping's turn to, to this kind of more aggressive nationalism, which, which is, we know is happening for a variety of reasons that have to do with, with you know, his ambition to discipline the party, which had become corrupt, uh, but also with, you know, kind of to project a new image of strength. And the idea of national humiliation is very much a central part of, of patriotic education. I mean, here we see just, you know, this is just a random group of children, of school children saluting, um, holding up a banner that says, you know, never forget national humiliation, and then um, um, it rejuvenates China, to, to translate quickly. Um, and this idea of rejuvenation, which is a central tenant of, of um, particularly now Xi Jinping's policy, I think, um, is inextricably linked to the idea of victimhood. Right? So it's, it's very much about correcting wrongs, but not in a way that was done in the Maoist period, where it was kind of said, we have corrected them, but rather this is still an ongoing thing where, you know, sort of any kind of um, offense um, must still be uh, dealt with. And this, this really hardens the domestic discourse. It creates uh, an atmosphere of hypersensitivity, one might say, to all sorts of perceived international offenses. Um, so, it's not, so it's not a, a, a surprising that as a result, relations with, with neighbors, not just Japan, which you know, clearly is the aggressor, but also uh, with neighbors like Korea are at, at historic lows because of perceived offenses to, to national pride. Now I would say that you know, this, kind of, uh, this victimhood um, should of course remind us of all the injustices that China faced when it was forcibly dragged into modernity you know, by, by the British and by you know, sort of the, this European system of trade, which I um, talked about at length. But we must also keep in mind that this is a narrative that is very much uh, instrumentalized. There was a political decision taken at some point, maybe not just one decision, but a series of decisions, right, to bring it back, to use it, to propagate it, to put it in, in textbooks, to, you know, to kind of um, make it there, make it, make it loud and make it out there. So this decision to reawaken the narrative was, was political and instrumental. And therefore, I think the effects that it will have on China's um, relations with the world, yes, they're an echo of history, of course. And it's very important to know this history to be able to understand why, you know, what is, what is never forget national humiliation. But at the same time, the current, I think, sensitivity is equally also a, a result of a of a newfound um, or more recent turn of the Communist Party towards um, a kind of new brand of, of nationalism, um, which, which wants to create a strong China, but yet is not quite sure how to let go of some of the painful past. That's it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rogelia. And we can start the Q&A session. Are there any questions? Uh, what what I will do then is, ah oh, yeah, you have the first, please, start with the first one. I would like to 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 ask a question arising from. Uh, um, my personal uh, impressions. Um, most of uh, the Chinese that I have uh, met um, for work or as friends, they always uh, differentiate between the Greeks and other Europeans. And they always uh, uh, the, the motto is always you and us we are the only people who have a real history 
is this the, the real reason for this difference in their perception or is it related more with the fact that just like the Arabs look towards the Greeks as a Western nation that has no imperialist um, history? Yeah, I think that's, a, that's an important distinction, right? So to, to, to think about also the role of, of those European countries who do not have a, a, a history of, you know, of guilt and, and a lot of skeletons in the cupboard when it comes to relations with China. I'm also like to think about, well, how can those countries actually improve relations, let's say, between EU and, and China? So that would be kind of a thought onward from that. But generally, I think, I mean... I think Chinese diplomacy is also very good at finding commonalities. So one thing that, that uh, you know, looking towards Greece is immediately strikes, you know, somebody who, who, who is, uh, you know, um, trying to, to further relations is, well, these are two ancient civilizations. Both, you know, both countries um, actually go to great lengths to, to claim this heritage. Um, and so, of course, this is a commonality. Right? Um, so I think it, it's both. I think it, you know, it, it both a, a kind of instrumentalized, let's say, um, approach, but at the same time, I think it is really important to say that, um, you know, countries in, in Europe, like, like Greece, which do not have a, a history of, of imperialism in, you know, in the 19th century and so on, can actually, you know, be conduits for better relations, right? Um, and, and they should be used for that. Um, because it is very difficult when, uh, you know, if, if every time the British or the Americans send ships uh, through the South China Sea to, to actually very rightfully enforce, you know, accepted rules of, you know, of, of laws of the sea and so on. But the optics are wrong, right? Because they are, again, sending gunboats like they did, you know, um, back in, 18, uh, 18, uh, in the 1840s and so on. So uh, I think, yeah, I, I think it, you're, you're right to, to point out that it is important. It's not just fluff. I think it is important to, to kind of say that, uh, you know, there, there are other countries which have possibility of better relations. Okay, very good. Uh, I can jump in with a couple of questions that I have sure. then. I will use my privilege as chair. Uh, so first of all, so one historical and one contemporary question. Uh, I'm really fascinated um, with the comparison uh, between uh, Qing China and Meiji Japan. Yeah. Uh, they both they were both confronted with modernity around the same time, but had massively different kind of responses to it. Okay, the Meiji went about and led a nation that industrialized very fast, as you know, and became a world power pretty quick, within decades, whereas the Qing they just couldn't get there. Right? Do you think this is an accident of history? Or do you think there are, because I know you also have a background in, um, in Japanese studies as well, do you think it's an accident of history uh, or there are other reasons for that? Um, I think, I mean, partly it can, it can just be an accident of history, but there are certain structural reasons, I guess, which, which, which existed in Japan and, and allowed it to pursue very similar reforms that um, you know, some of the, the Qing officials were thinking about, but far more successfully. I think partly it has to do with the fact that the Japan was, was already on the periphery of its old world system. So Japan belonged to the world system that was centered on China as a peripheral state. Um, whereas, of course, China was, of course, its, its, its central um, core, let's say, power. But I think more importantly, there are certain traits maybe that, that developed um, from um, you know, 17th century Japan onward, which enabled it to actually industrialize very quickly. And um, you know, a lot of authors have, have noted on the presumed similarity between some of the, the Japanese trading um, and commerce families um, and those that existed, let's say, in Holland and, and in England. So, they, so there was a kind of a, a social, let's say, uh, the soil was fertile for the seeds of capitalism to grow, right? So something like that. Um, but it's also other things. You know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Qing China was ruled by, by, by an elite class that was increasingly seen as foreign. Um, it wasn't before. I mean, this is, this is also what, quite, quite important about why I was talking about the ideas of nationalism and so on. You know, it, 
It, it wasn't that um, you know that the Qing were always considered to be problematic because of their heritage, but increasingly towards the end, this was very much, um, very much sort of you know what prevented them from pursuing the kind of reforms that, that happened in Japan. In Japan, it was easier. The emperor was the symbol of the whole nation, and you know um, people rallied around that. I mean, with also with with you know slight civil wars and, and weapons and so on. But yeah, I think it was it's generally that. No? Okay, great. Any other questions from the audience? I can then ask my second question, <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, which I hope it will be provocative enough mm -hmm. uh, to prompt more questions. Uh, now, victimhood, when you present yourself as a victim, is not an act of confidence, is it? It's an act of unresolved issues that are possibly projected um, into the future. I talk, I talk like my psychiatrist. Um, so, so this victimhood, um, do you think that uh, contradicts what we perceive as China being um, a, a very kind of confident, rising nation? Can a, can a victim rise like that? Uh, so, what is there? What is this um, contradiction that we're looking at, and how how is it relevant in terms of its uh, of China's uh, kind of international behavior? Um, yeah, this is an interesting one because, like, on on a personal note, of course, you would all everybody would hope that victims can rise, right? I mean, that's we all want to to believe that optimistic story that you know uh, that you know people who have been offended and have been wrong can you know, get over this and, and actually so on. But that's, that's in one thing that you talk about people and then another thing to talk about states, right? So while, you know, there's, it kind of gets more complicated when you talk about the uh, state's emotions, right? Because uh, is, is this an emotion? Does China have emotions? Does the state of China have emotions? Maybe like as an aggregate, maybe. Um, so I prefer to think of it as, as what purpose does it serve? Like why, why is it that this, this victimhood is being emphasized over and over and over again that there's two options right either it's sincerely felt maybe maybe the the, the leaders of china um when you know when they see that uh, i don't know like taiwan appears in a drop down menu at a hotel reservation desk feel so emotionally interrupted and, and offended that they must you know then force sanctions or maybe it's actually something else it it, it, it actually um serves a different kind of purpose um, a purpose to, to kind of uh, constantly remind, let's say, the, the other um, that you know, that China is back and that China is angry and that you know, uh, it, it is justified in, in its own reactions and so on. And I think maybe that's, that's one of the things. It's, maybe it's, it's a kind of way to, 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 to lessen um, you know, the ambitions. But I, I think it will blunt like, Chinese ambitions, right? I mean, it's not... Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to project confidence when, when you also, um, you know, lose it over small things, apparently, right? Um, and it's also difficult for, for other nations to then earnestly deal with, with China because, I mean, even on a practical level, right, people need to be now trained about what, what may or may not offend, um, you know, the, the Chinese government and so on. Um, and, and these things happen all the time, that, you know, somebody gets offended here or there, and then, you know, there's, there's consequences to this. So, I think it's, it's also, when you, th when you think about, like, victimhood, I think one thing that, that I fear was a really lost opportunity was actually to deal with the actual victims, right? Mm -hmm. People who were, you know, who lost family members, who were, who were, you know, on the receiving end of particularly, like, Japanese violence during the war, and their experiences were, were swept under the carpet, um, not seen as important because it was a period of, of celebration and, you know, everything was fine. And now this victimhood is, in a, in, to me, it's kind of confected, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not the victimhood of, of victims, it's the victimhood of, of, a, of a state, which I think states can't have emotions. I mean, maybe I'm <laughs> too much of a materialist. So if there's not emotions, then it's something else, you know? Mm -hmm. Good, great. Yes, yes, please. Uh, the, the microphone. We need it for the broadcasting. Ah, okay. 
Um, so on the same topic of victimhood, I was wondering, um, uh, is there, um, oh, I'm asking for your opinion, uh, do you think that it might serve also an um, uh, inside, is it maybe something that's happening because for inside consumption as well, like uh, taking the attention from time to time towards, uh, uh, I don't know, from one problem that China might be facing at a certain time uh, to uh, something that is not sure. there right now, but, oh, I'm still talking with that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, uh, I don't know if you've heard me, maybe you already. Very loud now. So, I was just um, quickly yeah. saying again, um, could it be that this victimization, victimhood, um, is in instrumentalized? Right from the Chinese government, from time to time, for more inside consumption, um, serving different purposes. Um, I know it's uh, maybe a very cynical way of seeing things, and I know this cannot be the only way of uh, seeing this. But um, could this also be an option uh, for us to consider? I, I think absolutely. I mean, not not just not just with victimhood, but I think a lot of the um, the, let's say, behavior of the Chinese state outwardly, um, very importantly, serves a domestic audience, right? But, but the problem is this is that, and you know, I can kind of mention a case um, which is fairly recent, which is the disputes between, between China and Japan over its maritime border. Um, and, and there you have a kind of... Um, um, a recurring, let's say, wave pattern, right, of... of um, some kind of dispute happening and then it kind of cools off and then, you know, again, you know, it, it kind of heats up and so on. But what, what changed, um, let's say, in, in the 2000s was that um, China started to use domestic outrage as part of its negotiation strategy with, with Japan, for example. So, um, you know, huge amounts of students were, were bussed in to, to Beijing to, to kind of bolster you know, spontaneous protests, um, you know, Toyota dealerships were, were, you know, attacked and burned down and, you know, stoned and so on. Um, and then once actually the negotiations moved, this was shut down, right? But the problem is that my question is, like, can you always shut down this, this kind of genie of, of, of national outrage that you've created? Um, and, and the answer is, well, not really, because we've seen now that, you know, increasingly this is not a narrative that is entirely controlled um, by, by the Communist Party, right? Um, you do have kind of outrages. I mean, you know, for now they're mainly confined to social media, things like that, right? Where, you, you know, you have kind of vigilantes against, uh, you know, also domestic actors which, which dare to step out of line and then are, you know, swiftly punished. So I think, it's, I mean, yeah, you can. It's part of a, a, a kind of, um, let's say, a system of disciplining, right? Um, also domestically. Um, in terms of, like, taking attention away, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that could happen as well, but, but you know, again, it, it's kind of hard to, to talk about it without, like, proof. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, I think that there's definitely a study there to be, to be made in terms of, like, when, when, when do outrages happen um, and do they coincide with any domestic events or not? Um, but I think the problem here is that once you start doing this, also as a policymaker, you, you, you begin to lose space because then every time you step back, you can be perceived as weak. And, and that's the one thing which, which um, the CCP, but particularly, I think, now, um, with, with Xi, does not want to do. They do not want to appear weak. So, so then what, how do you do? How do you negotiate your way out of, uh, of, let's say, a disagreement with Japan if any kind of concession might be punished by, by loss of legitimacy, right? So it's, it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy where you then have to be more and more radical. So that's why I'm, like, I'm saying that this... This victimhood is not is not is not good. It fuels a, a kind of uh, a policy which is not good for China. Like that's you know, let's be clear. Um, let alone for international relations or regional relations and so on. Hello. First of all, thank you very much. I had no idea about this century of uh, humiliation. It's the first time I hear something about this. And uh, it came up in my mind, 
how it is connected with um, the current um, uh, projects of China like BRI, uh, the New Silk Road, and the fear of Europe and the Western world that uh, China is uh, sooner or later conquer uh, Western countries. Uh, if this uh, uh, common uh, memory in uh, the state, if the state has a memory, or uh, to, to the common people, if this will, bring, uh, will, will take a revenge, let's say, for this century, and um, if uh, these projects will bring up uh, Chinese nationalism uh, inside the Chinese uh, society. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a really, really topical question, right? Because it's happening at the moment, all, of this, all these projects and BRI and so on. I mean, the first thing I would mention that is there is a connection here, right? Because you, you, you see that uh, Chinese actors are being very sensitive, very careful about avoiding any accusation of imperialism or colonialism or anything like that, right? So the, the message here is this is different. We're not doing the same thing. We, we haven't just learned the lessons that were inflicted on us and now we're doing the own, our own thing elsewhere, but this is actually something else. And this is you know, the origin of this, you know, ideas like win-win and so on and so forth. At the same time, I think under conditions that, that we will live in, in, in this kind of, you know, kind of global, uh, global capitalist system, China is, in many cases, the, the stronger, wealthier partner. So when it invests into, let's say, in, into Kenya and so on, um, it, it does so from a position of strength. Um, and this inherently then brings problems and accusations of, of imperialism, of colonialism, and so on and so forth. So one thing is that they're, they're very careful to keep the narrative clean, right, let's say. But on the other hand, some of these projects, it's very difficult to not be open to such accusations. Um, but not in a way that's different from, from Shell or you know, any other Western corporation, right? But what's maybe... Um, Interesting here is, is that I think, you know, having, and, and this is like an area that, that I've studied recently quite a lot, um, like the, the host governments often actually um, are very happy to accept China's proclamations that this is a different thing. Why? Because then it's very useful to, to sell this domestically, right? Mm -hmm. um, to say that, oh yes, we're borrowing money from, from a Chinese bank to build a railroad that nobody will use. Um, but it doesn't matter because this is all, it's all win-win. It's, it's new relations. It's, you know, we're fighting imperialists together, right? Um, so there's a, there's a certain amount of almost social capital, maybe, that, that China has in the developing world um, that it developed throughout the Maoist period, um, and actually very earnestly. I mean, in, in the neighborhood here, in Albania, um, you know, Chinese, you know, let's say, really um, uh, believed, right, in, in the relationship between China and Albania. They were building factories, mines, and so on. And then at some point, of course, the, the relationship soured because Albania sooner or later had a fight with everyone in its communist history, even with China. Um, and, you know, this was maybe a kind of precursor of, of the same kind of spirit that still exists in the BRI. But let's not fool ourselves. The BRI is a project for state-owned enterprises who want to make profits, who want to um, secure their position domestically, you know, who, want to, who are run by Communist Party officials who have careers to think about, right? So it's not, of course, goodwill. Um, but, but it is true that they, they do really are careful to, to not um, appear or not be called that. But at the same time, yeah, I mean, the West is, 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 is calling China a new imperialist, but it's a bit rich, right? I mean, it's... it's I, I always, yeah, I mean, whenever, you know, I don't know, like, the, the French government complains about, about uh, Chinese uh, in, in Africa, and I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, I think, and again, maybe back to, to, to your question, right? So it is also the role of, of the more neutral countries, which are not burden, but would nevertheless do believe in, in you know, sort of ideals of, of democracy and freedom of speech and so on, it's, it's also for us to kind of speak up about this, because the French and the English can't do it, because, you know, they've been compromised historically quite a lot. <laughs> Great. Uh, I would like to return on this, on Yorgos' question again, 
I wonder, uh, inside China, how much is, uh, is spread the debate about, uh, how, about if China is imperial, uh, imperialistic, even in a Chinese way, uh, if, if it's behaving in an imperialistic way. And uh, um, as far as we know, but I don't know how strong is this feeling, there are debates that uh, um, uh, the Chinese government, they, 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 uh, they're giving too much resources um, in order to, uh, to, to, to develop the BRI project all over the planet. And uh, while well, they can use these resources in order to be uh, to, 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 to develop uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese economy and Chinese society instead of, yeah. So there is such a debate. Uh, I would like, if you have more information, to expand. Well, thank you. I mean, not, not, not information in the sense of like really current stuff. I mean, I, I would have to think about like what, also because so little research is being done in, in China at the moment that, that we kind of hear about. This corona has really kind of severed a lot of the links. Um, but, but the BRI itself, I mean, I know like a couple of years ago, um, we were talking, maybe you were actually there and somebody said like, oh, are you, are you still working on the BRI? You know, nobody cares about it anymore in Beijing. Um, <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's kind of exactly for these reasons, right? It was seen as, as kind of maybe too much, too ambitious, um, too much too quickly. And I think many of the concerns, if you read, let's say, um, you know, some of the, the freer parts of the, of the Chinese press, you know, like business, essentially business publications like Caixin and so on, they, they complain about things like inefficiency um, or corruption or, you know, this project was, did not satisfy the, the high demands, um, which, which I think is great. I mean, it, it, it's kind of the beginning of some kind of a, uh, you know, a, a review and monitoring and a kind of reflection of like what it is that, that you know, the government is doing abroad and the state-owned enterprises are doing abroad. But I think it's very difficult to do this earnestly if, if your debate is so, is so limited and stunted and so controlled, right? So I don't think that, you know, there's a, there's a huge amount of debate, but I would love to hear the debate behind the closed doors, right? I mean, of what is, what I want to know is like how does the, the party feel about the BRI? Um, are they happy with the results? Because I, I, I don't think they would be. I mean, the results haven't been that fantastic, right? I mean, it's, yes, it's a lot of state-owned enterprises made a lot of money. Um, that's, that's true. But the kind of pushback that China received internationally is probably not worth it. Um, and a lot of, these, a lot of these, these projects have given China a bad name as, as a country that they will, they will lend but only to fund its own companies and so on. So reputationally, I don't think it's been a success. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's two options. Either, as we actually just this week heard that now China will no longer fund any new coal power plants, which were, you know, coal was, you know, sort of 30% of, of BRIs is coal. So, so there's clearly huge changes happening, some kind of re-evaluation of what the BRI is happening. Um, but, but in terms of, like, what exactly this might mean, that I'm not so sure about. Simply because I don't know. I mean, I can kind of speculate, but not, not, with, a, not with real facts, unfortunately. Yeah, that's an interesting point, because, I mean, if you think, if you think of the, you know, the, the, the project of cost coherent right? I mean, this existed before the BRI. Mm -hmm. uh, it became very politicized. Uh, globally, mm -hmm. after the BRI was introduced. Before that, I mean, no one was really talking about it. Mm -hmm. It was a successful in investment, and then after that, it became almost, uh, you know, the Trojan horse of China and Europe, and so on. And this really came after the 2000, uh, after the BRI was, was introduced. So, mm -hmm. really good point. There. Yeah. yeah, you see how, like, uh, controversies which, which would have remained local, I'm sure, like, any, I mean, any big project can be controversial, right? Um, even the, the most well thought out project will be controversial. But even, especially the ones that are not maybe thought out, the ones that have actual problems, um, you know, of course they're controversial sort of in the country, in the bilateral relations. But yeah, Pireus became controversial globally, but not because of the things that maybe it should be controversial. But it, was, it was controversial simply as a kind of symbol, a kind of totem of, of um, this belief that, that China is now being an imperialist country that is going to buy half of Europe. 
Um, even though, of course, you know, you should be so lucky. I mean, when we, what we do is sell stuff to China. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, um, we, we wrote an, an article with, with Igor uh, looking at these narratives of the BRI around certain projects. And about Piraeus, there was this uh, French academic, retired academic, who was saying, was claiming that the goal is to turn Piraeus into a double use port. So, like, have a military base of the Chinese in Piraeus. And this is. This was part, this was a dominant narrative right, in the debate. People believed that they, 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 the perception of the BRI was formed around this nonsense. Mm. But I think, I mean, if, if I can kind of, um, this is an expression in, from, from Slovenian, which is my, my own country, if I can divert water to my own mill, <laughs> which I'm, I'm sure you understand what that means, um, I think it's, it's really interesting how. It's, it's this kind of behavior that I was talking about, right, which, which informs the way that we see China now, right? It's, it's that if, like, you know, there's an investment in Piraeus, ah, this is a treaty port now, you know, essentially, right? So, it's, you know, it's, what, I guess what we have learned through history we then apply to, to new cases very quickly. Um, and it's not always accurate, but that's, that's what it is. I mean, history is what, you know, kind of colors our perception of the present. Um, yeah. Good. Are there any more questions or can we call it a day? Yeah? Okay, so there are no more questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Agelia, you for, me. For, for coming and for everything. And thank you all for attending. Yes, thank you for the questions. <laughs> Against all odds and <laughs> COVID conditions and so on.